Hello, everyone. This is the May webinar presented by the Essex County Branch of Ontario Ancestors. My name is Linda Urquhart, and I will be your host for tonight. Michelle Watson and Tammy Richard will be monitoring the questions. Thanks to them for doing that. Before we start, we would like to acknowledge the Indigenous peoples of all the lands that we are on today, including the first inhabitants of Essex County, the Potawatomi, Ottawa, and Ojibwa or Chippewa, as well as the Huron or Wendat or Wyandot bands. As family historians, we look for the stories of the men and women who came before us. In doing that, we must acknowledge the mistakes of the past and consider how we can best support our local Indigenous communities. Thanks for joining us. Just a reminder that this presentation is being recorded and will be added to the Essex County Branch YouTube channel. Also, everyone is muted and your camera is turned off during the presentation. Questions will be answered following the presentation. Just post your questions in the chat box as we go along. The chat box can be found by hovering your mouse at the bottom of your screen. We will be adding two handouts. One describes the method used to clean the headstones. The other includes the links to visit our webpage, join our Facebook group, where to find us on YouTube, and how to follow us on Twitter and Instagram. It also includes a list of upcoming webinars prepared by other branches and organizations that you may find of interest. For those of you who are first time visitors to our webinars, we are one of the 35 branches or special interest groups of Ontario ancestors, also known as the Ontario Genealogical Society, which is the largest member supported genealogical organization in Canada. It was founded in 1961 with its mission to encourage, bring together and assist those interested in the pursuit of family history and to preserve Ontario's genealogical heritage. We encourage you to visit their website where you can do a search for what they have on file about your ancestor, or you can view their monthly educational webinars. And you can also view their family history productions available in the marketplace. It's worth your while to investigate what is available there to assist you in your research. The Essex County Branch of Ontario Ancestors does not have any webinars during the summer. However, we have missed our in-person meetings where we could meet you and you could meet us and we could have informal chats and hear about your family research stories. Therefore, we have decided to have a meet and greet on Saturday, June the 3rd, at the Windsor Public Library Local History Branch. And you can see the address on the screen, 3312 Sandwich Street. Uh, we'll be able to show you the resources we have in that collection, as well as what the library has in its own local history collection. We'll be there from 10 a.m. till noon, and some of us plan to go for lunch at a local restaurant and would love to continue our discussions there. We will be resuming our webinars in the fall and are very excited to offer these excellent topics. In September, Tom Koch, the historian at Jack Miner's Sanctuary, will present the Miner family legacy. In October, Lori Brett will introduce her book, The Rising Village, An Early History of Essex. And in November, Ken McKinley will offer his tips on researching World War I soldiers. Tonight's webinar is being presented by the cemetery team of the Essex County Branch of Ontario Ancestors. They are again saving history, one stone at a time, at historic Windsor Grove Cemetery. Pat Clancy, the cemetery coordinator for the branch, and CJ Scott, a cemetery volunteer, will join us to discuss the history of the cemetery, the methods used to find those lost headstones, and as well, they will describe some of their most interesting finds. And with that, I'll pass it on to Pat and CJ. I'll stop sharing my screen. Sure. We're, we're just uh, 
Go ahead. Yep. Yeah. Um, to share. It's coming. Just have There's to switch. It. Great. Can everyone see our first slide, Saving History? Yes. Okay. Thank you, Linda, for that introduction. And as Linda mentioned, I am Pat Clancy, the chair of the cemetery team for the Essex branch of OGS. And I'm excited, along with CJ Scott here beside me as my tech support person, <laughs> um, to talk about our work at Windsor Grove Cemetery. And as Linda mentioned, we'll, um, um, we're going to be, I'm going to be covering a bit about the history of the cemetery. Um, what our work has entailed over the last uh, the last three seasons, and then talk about some of the interesting and sometimes unusual finds that we've come across during our during our work. Now, Windsor Grove was established from a bylaw on the twenty eighth of July in eighteen sixty four, and it's one of the oldest cemeteries in the area. Assumption Cemetery was established around 1860, St. John's Anglican about 1802, but Windsor Grove is the first public cemetery for the city. Now, a lot of people think that 1927 was when it was established because they see that above the gate at the uh, Giles Street entrance, but that is most likely the date that the uh, gate was erected as land was expropriated. Um, along Giles, Mercer, and Ellis Streets to add to Windsor Grove. Now, Windsor Grove initially consisted of 12 acres of land within the town of Windsor, and this land was owned by the Windsor Improvement Company. The size of the cemetery is now approximately 16 acres. The Soper Farm was on the property and eventually added to uh, Windsor Grove. In the late 1950s and early 60s, the trustees recognized that they were running out of space at the current cemetery, so they purchased property out on Division Road, the south end of the city, and that is what is now called Windsor Memorial Gardens. Windsor Grove was and continues to be managed by a board of trustees, and the same board and staff manage and oversee both cemeteries. Now, Windsor Grove is still an active cemetery, i.e. burials still take place, but plots are sold out, um, but there are some pre-purchased lots that are still vacant. And at the, at the current time, they have approximately five or six burials per year. Now, this is a copy of the original plan of Windsor Grove. And I, I uh, took it from the Museum Windsor site. And the date is pre-1867 because you will note it says that Windsor Grove Cemetery is in the town of Windsor CW, which would be Canada West. Now you can see the letters of the various sections of the cemetery. Uh, those, are, those letters are still used uh, to the current day. Um, section A in the middle, it's marked as being reserved for a chapel but that chapel never came to being in that area has burials as, um, as well. Now, some of the roadway names have changed and land was added on the south end, which is the left of your screen, the west side, which is the top and the north end, which is the right. Now, this is a picture of only part of the cemetery team. Um, We've grown from six members several years ago to about 10 last season. And this picture was actually taken in early November, our last uh, work session of the season. And uh, as I mentioned, it's not the entire team. There's four or five people that weren't there that day. Um, last week, we had our first uh, work session for the season and had five new volunteers. So we're quite excited about the year ahead and the interest that we're, uh, that we're garnering. Now we meet at Windsor Grove one morning a week during the spring to the fall. We start in early May and run to early November. And we have to stop them when the tempers, temperatures start to drop when there's a risk of them 
going below freezing, there's an issue, number one, of the cleaners working properly, but also of water getting into cracks and crevices on markers that could cause further, uh, further damage. Now, we also have several volunteers working behind the scenes from a distance, doing vital work such as transcribing from photographs, proofing, um, and indexing. And it's important as well. Um, this group is just as important as well as the people that work on site in order to help us get the information out there. Now, the goal of our work is to preserve the information that's on cemetery markers. So we photograph and transcribe the markers to make information available for family and other researchers in the future. Now, at one time, volunteers would go out with paper and pencil, they would write down what was on the marker, move on to the next one, write it all down, go home, type it all up. In the last five or six years, we've begun to photograph the markers, upload them to the cloud, then transcribe them from that and then continue with proofing before we create publications. Our eventual goal is to get photos online, but we acknowledge that it is a slow process and all of our progress depends on the volunteer resources that we have available. Now this work is particularly important at Windsor Grove because of a number of factors. One has to do with the cemetery's age. It's 159 years old, and the older markers especially deteriorate over time. Markers get broken for a variety of reasons, and it's not unusual to come across some where we just cannot read what the inscriptions are despite cleaning and using other uh, techniques. So we want to get information down before it uh, becomes even less visible. At this cemetery, records have also lost, been lost over the years due to reported fires and floods when the office was actually on site at Windsor Grove. As a result, this marker may be the only record that indicates where an individual is buried. There may also be other information on the marker that can be clues for further research. Now, in August of 2019, the team started at Windsor Grove with the cemetery's permission. In order to take the photographs, we need the information to be legible. We often need to pull back weeds, grass, dirt, as flat markers or even some fallen ones have become overgrown or buried over time. Vandalism also occurs occasionally. Stones get broken and overturned and they're just too heavy for us to turn over. The cemetery has been working too overturn those that have been damaged, but it is a long process and time consuming. Now it's not unusual to see markers that are very difficult to read. Environmental dirt, growth such as lichen and moss, deterioration of the stone are all causes that impede the legibility. And this is both with flat and upright markers. If stones are illegible, depending upon the cause, we may use a special stoke called Orbis and a soft brush to clean them with water. We want them legible for the photographs. We would love to be able to clean every single stone in the cemetery, but we just can't do it. We don't have the resources, both the, um, the manpower as well as the, um, the cost for the cleaners. So our, we try to keep in mind that we're cleaning the markers to make them legible. If it's an issue of lichen, moss, biological growth, that kind of thing, Orbis may not work and we will use a product called D2. This is a biological cleaner that kills growth, is sprayed on and we wait for an hour and then brush with soft brushes. Sometimes we'll spray it and just leave it as it continues to work for up to a year. It was about the second year of our work at Windsor Grove that we began the use of D2 after extensive research. It has been approved by the Cemetery Conservators for Uniform Standards Organization, and it also meets the U.S. National Cemetery Administration Best Practices Protocols, and they're responsible for all of the, the veteran markers in the U.S. Now, if you want to see someone in action cleaning the markers, if you um, 
look for the YouTube channel, Honor Your DNA, and it's H-O-N-O-R because it's an American um, individual. And he demonstrates cleaning veterans markers with the, um, with the products that we are using. Now, here's an example of a marker that I cleaned using just um, Orva soap and water and a brush. And you can see that um, even though it's moss, the Orva soap worked well in just elbow grease and the marker looked almost like new. Now, here's another one from Thomas J. Elliott and his family. This marker had a lot of um, you know, lichen in the dark dark growth. We used D2 on that in order to get it up to a, a much cleaner state. And that took several weeks. We came back, you know, each week to take a look at it. And each week you could see it, it was cleaner than the, the previous one. And during the time that the D2 is working, sometimes you'll see like an orange streaking and not to worry because that is just the uh, D2 going to work. And it eventually goes away as you can see from the uh, from that marker. Now we've just learned that a product called Wet and Forget has also been approved by this group in the US. So we're looking at whether we can add that to our, um, to our arsenal of cleaners, but we haven't yet tried it out, but um, we'll be investigating that one as well. We do not use any other products or materials on the markers as we do not want to damage them, which many other products can do. Now the oldest sections of Windsor Grove have irregularly shaped plots that may hold two, four or more remains. They're not necessarily in neat rows facing one way, which makes recording a challenge. Now here's an example of one area and the small squares, rectangles, various shapes, only indicate the owner of the plot at one time. These can be helpful, however, when we're reading surnames of markers that aren't as easily read. So sometimes if we know what we might be um, expecting in terms of a surname, that can help us uh, read it more clearly. And here's another example of another, cement, uh, another section. You can see the surnames. The squares are actually very, very small, like they'd be less than an inch square, many of them. And, and I often take a magnifying glass to try and read them more clearly. About the second year when we were into the very old sections, we noted empty spaces in some areas, such as a gap in a row between markers. Or for example, there might be a large stone with only a surname and no individual markers around. And we thought there should be something else here. How can we find out? So we started using um, a metal probe. It's about four feet long with a sharp point on the end and just started poking into the ground where we thought there should be a marker. And we did begin to find buried markers. And this is kind of one of the more exciting parts of our, uh, of our work because some of these markers have been buried for years and years and there's no record of this person in the cemetery and we have now found the marker that um, so that we can add them. We're not always lucky sometimes we uh, we don't find them or you might hit a base and there's still no actual marker but um, it's certainly um, helpful in and an exciting part of, um, of our work. Now there's a database on our branch website of approximately 20,000 names of burials for Windsor Grove. And it was compiled um, by a number of volunteers. I know Linda Urquhart was um, um, and spearheaded this, the creation of this index. And the sources include cemetery records themselves, photographs donated by an individual and held in the office at Windsor Memorial Gardens, um, burial registers between 19 and 1924, that Linda and I scanned um, from the office, uh, the cemetery database itself, as well as photographs from Canada GenWeb. Now this past winter, we started cross-checking the photographs that we've been taking with the database and found that some names are not in that database. 
So we've started adding those as well as making other additions and corrections. So the database and the index are always uh, continuing to grow and who knows what the final, the final number will be. So the public does have access to the index on our website. If you go to the homepage, essex.ogs.on.ca, then across the top, you'll see the heading resources, drop down and it says Windsor Grove Sanitary Index. Just click on that and you'll be able to search for any particular surnames that you're looking for. Um, and you will be able to, if they're the individuals there, you'll be able to get their names and the year of their birth or death if known. Now you'll also find on this page a driving tour of Windsor Grove Cemetery that was created by Michelle Watson, one of our um, local operating team members. And there is a link on that page to the YouTube, to the YouTube channel uh, with that driving tour. So it's pretty interesting to um, sort of take the drive through the cemetery and see the various sections. And, and many people have commented that they didn't realize how large the cemetery, how large the cemetery was. Now the actual database is within the members library and has additional information not on the public index. So for example, specific dates, locations if known, uh, name of spouse or maiden names. And for that, to access that, you just sign in with your email and your password to the members library. Um, go to the purple box that says cemetery transcriptions You'll come up to the next page and you want to click Windsor and Walkerville. Click on that and scroll down to the bottom and you will find Windsor Grove. And it really is a gold mine. It's currently 411 pages and growing. So as I mentioned, one of the most exciting parts of our work is finding buried markers. And generally we'll, we'll uncover four or five markers. Um, each week. So here's an example of one instance. We've got CJ um, pulling back the grass. Someone had already probed around that area to see if there was a marker down there, felt something was there. So she pulled the grass back and voila, we now have the marker for Annie Davis, 1832 to 1914. And when I went to look her up in our database, it turns out she's not there. So we'll be adding her name for sure. Another example is Iva Marguerite Kettlewell. And the photo is courtesy of Ancestry. Um, one of the members had posted it on their page. So I, that's where the photograph came from. And if you look in the, the um, first picture of the ground, you can just see a small area where there looks to be a marker. So again, we started, someone started probing around to see if we could outline the size of the marker and um, pulled back the dirt and came up with the marker for, uh, marker for Iva Marguerite Kettlewell, who died at the age of, I believe it was six, in 1926 or 1928. So as I said, we don't always find something where there are gaps. Sometimes we'll come up with a base, sometimes there'll just be gravel, or sometimes there's just plain dirt. Another example is John Furzer Elliott. He was appointed in 1840 as a collector of customs for the Port of Windsor. And according to his marker, died in 1869. So he is one of the earlier burials in the cemetery. Um, now his, as I mentioned, is a large marker. We cleaned it up using uh, Orvis as well as D2. And then started looking at it and looked at the top and it looked like there should have been something else on top, that it just shouldn't have been square like that. So again, somebody starts poking around and lo and behold, one marker to the side that appears to have been broken. So it was in two pieces and there was also another one in the front.
So now I'm going to talk about some of the unique headstones and stories that we have come across during our work at the cemetery. It's not unusual for us to look at a marker or, or a few people look at a marker and say, oh, that's kind of interesting. And they'll you know, take a picture or take note of the name and go home and, and research it um, just so that we can find out you know, what kind of story might be attached to this individual. So the first one we're looking at here is, you can see a fireman's hat. So it's pretty obvious that this individual, Captain Joseph Pringle was a fireman. And the transcription reads, erected to the memory of our late captain, Joseph Pringle, erected by the members of number three hose. So they would be his colleagues that, um, that he worked with as a fireman. Now, right next door is another marker. This is a large red granite one. And it reads, in memory of George Irwin, engineer native of Cumberland, England, aged 46 years, who died on the 18th of May, 1876. Also, Joseph Pringle, a fireman and stepson of the above, aged 42 years, who died on the 20th of May, 1876. So look at that. And there's a lot of good information there. We've got names, we've got where George Irwin was from. Um, we've got their occupations. We've got their ages and it says George was 46, his stepson, 42. Well, that's kind of close in age, but you know, it's a stepson, it could be. And they only died two days apart. So I looked up Joseph and his death registration says that he was age 23. And in the 1871 census, five years before his death, he was living with his stepfather, George Irwin, and he was just 17 at the time. So it appears 42 years is not correct, whether they meant to put in 24 um, and they made a mistake, we don't know, but it just points out you need to go to the primary source for information to confirm because errors can be made um, engraving, either they haven't got the right information or they make a mistake when they're doing the, uh, doing the actual engraving. But we didn't want to stop there with, with this marker and these two gentlemen. So their death registrations were looked up. I mentioned we looked at Joseph's, but for both of them, it states that they died from a scalding incident in London, Ontario. So that got me thinking whether there's some information in the newspaper about this incident. Two, you know, a fireman and an engineer at both sides at the same time. So you can see how easily we can go down rabbit holes. So on newspapers.com, I found several newspaper articles that indicated a switch was left open on a rail line where George Irwin was the engineer and um, Pringle was on the same, uh, on the same train. And switch was left open, the train went off the track and both Irwin and Pringle was, were scalded from water from the boiler. There was an article about uh, a hearing that was held. The GTR, the Grand Trunk Railway was found negligent and the switchman, David Spence was actually charged with manslaughter. Now, I tried to find out what happened to David Spence but I couldn't find uh, couldn't find any any information on that, but um, but that would be make make an interesting research project for someone. So as I say, it just points out you have to go to the primary information, um, make sure the information on the marker is correct. But also, if you start looking up some of these uh, some of these incidents, you can come up with some really interesting uh, interesting stories. Now this is another interesting marker. This one, this one is a seat hollowed out from the shape of a tree trunk and the initials at the bottom state TB. Now we've got Thomas there. Don't think we know it's Thomas, but anyway, um, several feet away is the shape of a log or a branch in the ground. And it says Bigelow, B-I-G-E-L-O-W. It's um, 
it does look like two L's from, but you have to look closely. The only Bigelow in our index for the cemetery is a Laura Bigelow buried elsewhere within the cemetery. And we haven't yet been able to match them up and haven't been able to identify through family search or ancestry um, who TB is. So that's just an interesting marker. And again, a story we don't know anything about the individual. Now this next marker, or actually a set of markers belong to the Sedley family, Frederick and Sarah. The main marker is an open book atop a tree stump. A tree trunk usually symbolizes the brevity of life. An open book symbolizes a book of life, a Bible, learning, a scholar, a prayer, or memory. Now, to the right, if you look at the top right picture, you can see in the background, there's a smaller marker, and it has a lamb on the top. And lambs are often used for children as a symbol of innocence and sacrifice. And that marker is um, for Frederick Sedley, who died in 1867 at the age of one year and eight months. On the left page of the book, there's a Charles Sedley, who died in 1890 at the age of 22. And then another son, John, who died in 1875 at the age of three years and one month. And on the right page is Frederick Sedley, who died in 1879 at the age of 45. So you can see why a tree stump would be appropriate when you look at the number of children that they lost at a young age, as well as Frederick himself dying only at the age of uh, 45. Also of note is that only Frederick is on the right page. There is nothing about his wife. And also note that the, um, the entries made into the book were not done in chronological order because we've got one in 1890, one in 1875, and then another in 1879. So, um, as I said, they weren't done in um, the order of death. Now, Sarah, Frederick's wife, died the 7th of March, 1902, in Detroit at her son's home. And according to the obituary, she was buried in Windsor Grove but we have no record of where she is actually buried, although it's likely um, to be in the same plot uh, with the rest of the family. Um, but as I say, we don't have anything to say that definitively. And her name isn't on the marker. It could be possible that it just, no one followed up and had it uh, added to the marker. Now this was an interesting find by our team. This marker appears to be just some cement that was poured on the spot and a tool of some sort used to engrave the name of the deceased and the dates. It was another one that we uncovered. And the transcription reads, S.T. Brooks, January period, 1916 period, 1928. And this is Spencer Thomas Brooks. His death date is actually the 19th of January, 1928. So, and he was, according to his death registration, was born the 14th of November, 1914. So it's hard to say why the dates, um, or why the numbers are in there as, as they are, whether someone started to um, inscribe something and then change their mind or they got the year wrong, it's hard to say, but um, um, again, indication where you need to, to look at primary sources. And it almost looks like either a nail or a, a stick or something was used to, uh, to engrave the information. Now, Spencer was the son of Alfred Brooks and Emily White, and Alfred was a carpenter and laborer living in Sandwich West in the 1921 census. He had uh, 
two other sons and a daughter. And, you know, it's just probable that he didn't have the money to um, erect a, a, the usual type of marker that we'll see. Or he felt perhaps that this was just more appropriate for, um, for his family member. Okay. Now, this was another interesting marker we came apart, came across. And the transcription says, Mrs. C. Jackman, late, this is H. Lutnam, died February 4th, 1914, age 46 years, mother. Now I kind of scratched my head and thought, okay, is this two women that are sisters? Well, no, but there's only one date and it says mother. Okay. Um, perhaps it was one woman that was married twice. Um, you died in 1914, but who was the, you know, which husband died first? What are the names? We didn't even have the husband's names. It wasn't unusual to be missing your wife's first name. So I did, did some digging and found that Eliza Lutman, a widow, married Walter J. Jackman, a widower on the 2nd of July, 1914 in Windsor. I thought, well, July 1914, this says she died February 4th. Is it the same person? And her father on that um, marriage registration was listed as Charles Stacy. So uh, I checked her death registration and she actually died the 4th of December, 1914, not the 4th of February. And the informant was Herbert Lutman, a son. So I was able to find the son's marriage um, in 1916, which named Eliza Stacy and Herbert Lutman as his parents. So this appears to be Eliza Stacy, who originally married Herbert Lutman. He died, it appears from what I found in England in 1913, then she came to Canada and married Mr. Jackman in um, 1914. Now, it still doesn't um, clear up the question of Mr. Jackman's first name because the tombstone says C and their marriage registration says Walter J. Um, but this appears to be Eliza Stacy, married Lutman, and then married Mr. Jackman. But again, another case you have to uh, confirm with primary sources your information because um, she didn't die before she got married the second time. Okay. Now, the story of the Seagrave Mausoleum. This was another of the very exciting um, events that happened with our, with our team. Those that are familiar with Windsor may recognize this building. It's a dome-shaped building on the east side of the cemetery, close to Howard, um, close to Ottawa Street, near the Howard Street gates. Frederick Seagrave was a manufacturer of fire trucks and engines and related equipment. And in the 1890s built a plant in Ohio. The company is still in operation in the United States and known for its fire equipment. Now the cemetery records indicate that Frederick bought the plots to build this mausoleum in 1900. Our database that I've already talked about had two burials in the mausoleum, Frederick and his wife, Adelaide. Now last summer, a photo surfaced of the interior of the mausoleum. And someone with eagle eyes noted that there are 12 crypts inside and there are six nameplates, but we only have records of, or an indication of two individuals that are buried inside. So we thought who else is in this mausoleum. So we contacted the cemetery manager, is there any way that we can get in to find out what names are on these nameplates? We were told, told the door had been welded shut for a number of years due to vandalism and not likely that we would be able to get in, which was very disappointing, obviously. However, a day or two later, we get a phone call that they were able to get into the 
mausoleum. And Tony, the manager, and several of the team members went in. We were able to clean up the six uh, plates on the end of the uh, on the end of the crypts and identify the six individuals inside. And these included Frederick and his wife, Adelaide. Frederick died in 1923, Adelaide in 1932. Milton, a grandson, age one year, died in 1913. Marion Rutledge Jane was Adelaide's mother who died in 1899. Fanny Judd, Adelaide's sister, died in 1911. And Wilbur Dowd died in 1903, and that was Adelaide's nephew, or Marion's grandson. So we were very excited to be able to identify where these, um, who these other people were. However, there was something that didn't quite seem right. Marion died December 30th, 1899. The plots weren't purchased until 1900 to build the mausoleum. And of course, we don't know how long it took to actually um, do the building. So we're still not sure where she was from the time she died until the mausoleum was built, because back then there weren't many options. We don't know whether she was in, in another plot and was reinterred. Um, we, we just don't know. So the mausoleum has since been secured against, secured again, and it was one of the more, as I said, one of the more exciting events for the for the team. And this photo was courtesy of Bill Lester. Um, I can't think we got it from uh, Swodas, the um, Southwestern Ontario Digital Archives. Now the next individual we're highlighting here is a gentleman called Lyndon C. Brooks. Now Lyndon was the first motorman for an electric streetcar in North America right here in Windsor, and also the first black motorman. And we were preparing last summer for Doors Open, which was an event where we highlighted 12 uh, individuals and markers in the cemetery. And his name came up as someone to include on the tour. We looked for his marker. We knew the plot where he was buried. But unfortunately, there is no marker. So at first we said, well, that's unfortunate. We won't be able to include him in the tour. And then we said, no, his story still deserved to be told. So the cemetery went, and went ahead, installed a, a cement base for um, future marker, if the family uh, determines, and they also put up a temporary marker. And you can see it says Lyndon Seabrooks, North America's first motor, streetcar motorman, February 22nd, 1853 to January 16th, 1935. And the streetcar actually began running in 1886, ran for several years um, from Windsor, which was at the foot of Olette and Riverside Drive uh, into Walkerville, which would be several miles uh, each way. Now, this marker is for Helen Cumming Ziegler, and it's an unremarkable marker on the flat marker on the west side of the cemetery. But the phrase world and life adventurous caught the eye of a team member who then went home and did some research to find out what Helen did that, that uh, deserved this phrase. So it turns out Helen Cumming was born in 1902 in Windsor to Robert Cumming and Rose Pelion. And she was an advocate and of various charities in the city, and began her career at the Windsor Daily Star. She became the Canadian correspondent for the Detroit Free Press, and then promoted to be London correspondent. And with the advent of World War II, she stayed in London for a while, then late in 1940, moved to New York City and became an accomplished journalist, editor, and newspaper correspondent and had uh, um, work appear in numerous publications, including the New York Times, a Saturday Evening Post, the Herald Tribune, Mademoiselle, and Vogue. And her stories were on exhibit in Washington, Washington DC at the American Museum for Women and the Windsor Public Library at the local history branch 
um, has a scrapbook about that showing in further information. And you go onto the Windsor Library uh, website and just Google her name, you can find, uh, or do a search for her name, you can find a lot of information about her. So she married in 1955 and lived in Manhattan with her husband until she died at the age of 96. So this is an example of a seemingly ordinary marker. There's just an interesting phrase on it. And with a bit of research, you can find out some uh, remarkable individuals and, and what they did. Now this name, Gordon McGregor, may be very familiar to local people. He was a co-founder of Fort Canada and is interred in the mausoleum on the, the west side of Windsor Grove. Now his marker is not public as the mausoleum is only open to those who have family members interred within the mausoleum, have to have a key to get in. So you can see the set of wooden doors in the left uh, photograph and the McGregor family name is on a plaque above the doors. And behind that door is a short hall, <clears throat> excuse me, with six crypt and you can see the large marble slabs with his name and dates on it. And Gordon became the president of his father's company, <clears throat> excuse me, Walkerville Wagon Works. And he reached an agreement with Henry Ford to form and finance the company to manufacture and sell Ford products in Canada, and also obtained rights to sell Ford products in the British Empire. In the first year of production, the Windsor plant produced 117 automobiles, and by 1922, they were producing 51,000. And Gordon McGregor died in 1922 at the age of 59 and had the largest funeral cortege ever seen in Windsor at that time. Um, newspaper, newspaper reports state he gave freely of his time and energy for many community projects and never lost the human touch. Okay. This next set of slides covers what we in our group refer to as the big dig. This happened in October of 2021. As with other situations, we saw the marker here that seemed to be missing something on top. All it had on it was Dostin, D-O-S-T-O-N, the surname. No information on particular individuals. So members started poking and probing, probing around, digging about and found that this buried marker which was much bigger than anything that we had come across before. And it was pretty solidly wedged down in the ground. So the cemetery themselves called in the pros um, to, in order to pull the marker out of the hole and find out what it said. And a large obelisk was revealed. It was about six feet long, I would say. William Dawson, born March 29th, 1826, died July 3rd, 1899. And some further research shows that he was a farmer in Raleigh Township near Chatham in the 1861 and 1871 censuses. His death registration indicated that he was a box maker and born in Kentucky and died in Windsor on Mercer Street. So at some point in time between 1871 and 1899, he moved, uh, he moved into Windsor. So just some final thoughts now. This picture shows one of our members role is working away with an umbrella shielding her, not from the sun, but from the rain. And it's just an example of the enthusiasm that our team members have for what we're doing, especially if we're out there working and it rains when we weren't expecting to rain or we hit the probabilities where we could get away before it started raining, um, we hate to leave. So Rose stuck around a little longer that day. No, I'm speaking to, or I'm probably speaking to the converted here, 
but cemeteries are extremely interesting places and there is so much history to learn. Markers can be key to researchers. You may find information that you don't find elsewhere. However, as I pointed out already, you do need to confirm the information through further research. Check out the dashes. Some individuals like Iva Kettlewell and Spencer Thomas, those dashes are pretty short, but there are also long dashes for other people. But find out what happened to that individual. Why is their dash short? Why is their dash long? Take care of markers properly. Do no harm is the motto that we try to follow. Get information down from the marker before it becomes lost. As I mentioned earlier, there's some markers that no matter how much we clean them or study them or different techniques, we just can't, um, we just can't pull much off them. They're just too old. We advocate both photographs and written transcriptions. There is still a call for written publications, which means that the information is, document, is documented. Websites can go down, books can be lost or destroyed. If you've got more than one um, media type for storing the information, you're likely to, uh, to have it last. I encourage pe people to reach out and support cemeteries in order to sustain them and their history. Look for groups in your area that are already working or start up a group. On-site work is always needed, but there's always the behind the scenes work, uploading to websites, doing transcribing, creating indexes. You don't have to be on site to do that. Anyone wanting to volunteer, either for the Essex branch, or if someone's looking for further information, they can just email me at essexcemeteries at ogs.on.ca. So before I end the formal presentation, I just wanted to say a thank you to a number of, of groups to make this work possible. The cemetery staff gave their permission back in 2019 for our group to go in and do our work and their support of the work we do makes it possible. The cemetery team is a great group of individuals who come out on a regular basis. We do have a lot of fun, even when it rains, even when we have to do a lot of digging, but the stuff we find makes it all worthwhile. What we find raises questions, and as I've mentioned, it's not unusual for some members to go home and research some of what we found. But the team also consists of volunteers behind the scenes, those doing the transcribing and proofing and helping to get the information out there. And I want to also thank the attendees, you who have listened to the webinar. I hope you have found it interesting and will for, this will provide some incentive to help support other cemetery groups out there working to keep our history alive. So are there any, any questions now? And my email is up on that, uh, that final slide as well. Hi, Pat. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay. Um, I, I do have a question that um, I think maybe I can answer even. Um, the question is, any idea what year uh, the last plot was sold at Windsor Grove? Did you have any um, idea of that? No, I don't. No, okay. Uh, no, we, we don't have that information. However, um, there are still some cremation lots that are sold. Um, not very many, but there are some that are sold because obviously cremation burials don't take up as much room. And there are also a few niches and crypts that are left in the mausoleum that are, are still being sold. But for full burial, um, they haven't been sold there for, for a while. So there's that question. Um, and then the next question is, how would you clean an old gravestone that is pitted? That is pitted? Yes. Just the same techniques as I 
mentioned before, um, we spray them down with water first, use a soft brush, put some Orva soap on it, um, wash it with the Orva soap. Um, I, if it's pitted or if it's flaking, I think I'd, I'd be very careful in terms of how much rubbing you would, you would do. Um, I'm not sure whether, yeah. I don't know, that's a good question. It probably depends on the material, I would think. Yeah, because we do see some markers that there is some flaking and you have to be very careful. Um, you know, those are very, very early ones, but pitted ones, if there's no flaking, um, I would say you can probably use the same techniques that we are, that we're using. And, and those are listed in your handout, correct? Yes. No sharp objects, um, you know, nothing that could damage the stone. Um, we'll use popsicle sticks sometimes to get into little crevices or um, I've seen people use toothbrushes but with a popsicle stick, you know, it will wear down before the marker wears down. So it's soft. Um, so it's not going to damage the stone. The stone's going to damage the obstacle stick. Tammy, you want to take the next question? We have a question from Wendy. Uh, do you think that people were buried during the epidemic without markers? Oh, quite I possible. Assume that would be what, 1917? Yeah, I think it was 17 to 19 that was the Spanish flu. Is that the one they're referring to, I wonder? Or? It just says epidemic. Yeah, no <laughs> doubt there were, because even through normal times, non-epidemic times, you know, people are buried without markers. Um, you know, if it's an older member of the family, you know, family left to see that one's erected or people forget or, you know, yeah, they don't have any money. Yeah, quite possible. Okay. So, uh, Bill asks, when you lift a sunken stone, what gravel, and he's got question mark, material do you place under the stone to keep it visible for the future? I don't know. We're not actually involved in doing that. Like we will, we'll put, you know, grass and, and dirt underneath it to keep it level. Um, but we give the cemetery a list of markers that we unearth that are very low, and then they will go, you know, behind us and, and you know, they can't raise them all. Um, but I don't know exactly what the, you know, what type of material. Yeah, we don't do the actual, that would be, I think, part of a, of a restoration process that that's not within our mandate or expertise. And then um, we have, have you done St. John Anglican Cemetery yet? Um, Linda might be able to correct me if I'm wrong. I believe it was transcribed back in the 1980s. That was when the branch first started going around the city and the county transcribing cemeteries. Um, so our group has not gone to sort of update our records. We're still on the first pass of cemeteries in the area. Um, but I believe it was already transcribed. Linda, are you? Yes, you're right, uh, Pat. Um, it was transcribed. During the 1980s, I believe uh, there was a project for students to do it that one summer. Yeah. So I think the cemetery team, their mandate is to try to go to cemeteries that have never been uh, transcribed yeah. before. And since uh, St. John's was transcribed, and, and really there's not enough people to be able to do what this cemetery team is doing at Windsor Grove, because it's when they were transcribing back in the 80s, nobody was looking for stones that were hidden in the ground. 
They yeah. just transcribed what they could read. Mm -hmm. I don't even believe there was any cleaning done. Uh, yeah. So, you know, it, it's a transcription of what was available on the headstones. We were lucky that we were able to obtain uh, the cemetery um, records to go ahead, to go along with uh, the headstones because I'm sure there are many in the index that don't have any any markers at all, but they're still in the index if the cemetery record was still uh, available. Yeah. Now there may be photographs of those markers on, you know, there's a number of websites out there. There may be photographs of St. John's on some of the websites. Um, that have been taken since then, but um, off the top, I don't Yes, know. absolutely. The GenWeb, um, Ontario GenWeb has the uh, has a lot of Essex County cemeteries. Uh, Canadian Headstones is another um, site where you can find uh, uh, pictures of, of different headstones from different cemeteries, but uh, we have all of our cemetery transcriptions uh, in our members' library. Because all over Essex County, many, many have been already completed. Uh, I see that uh, Bill Young has his hand raised. Um, is he able to um, unmute his mic so that he can ask? Maybe Colleen, can you do that, Colleen? Just give me one second and I will find Bill. Okay, oh. am I through? Yes, you are, Bill, go ahead. Okay, uh, operator error on my part as I was trying to find where the downloaded um, uh, items were for the webinar. I'd like to thank you and your crew I also want to thank the motivational factor that Essex somehow provides to have 11 volunteers, 10, 11 volunteers that would come out on a consistent basis over this year, uh, three year project. I am currently volunteering with a cemetery group in Caledonia where it's been a 20 year volunteer group from a local church. And uh, those volunteers are uh, becoming very old and uh, not able to do what they love to do. And uh, it's so hard to find volunteers. Um, I'm in Niagara Falls, so it's an hour and a bit drive each way to help out at the cemetery. We have had some luck with a county a uh, grant process where they will give grants to nonprofits uh, where um, actually we can charge for our volunteer labor hours, which will be then reimbursed by a certain percentage to the nonprofit, which has been a godsend. And we're able to get some high school students who wanted their community hours. Anyhow. To your point, excellent presentation. Thank you very much. Your dedication and uh, the work that you do. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you for your kind words. Um, when you're talking about how difficult it is to get new people, um, it has been a slow process even for us. I think one of the, um, one way that has been helpful in terms of garnering interest is social media. And Facebook, we have one member who just about every week will post a couple pictures and say, you know, look what we have found today. Come on out and join us, blah, 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 blah. And we've, I'd say probably half of the people that we have now, we have, um, have gotten involved through that route. And I think we've got more non-OGS members than we do members on the, um, on the team, um, which, is, which is fine. And uh, it's, as I say, it's a slow process, but I think that has been one way of, uh, 
of us garnering interest. People will, you know, the individual doing the posts will say email Pat at, and they put my email out there and I'll get an email from them and let them know what we do, how often, when, and, um, you know, just over time, over time, we've gotten um, quite a few new people that way. Thanks for the tips. Okay. Do you have time for a couple more questions? Sure. Okay. Um, this one, um, do you know about any graves being moved for the road building at St. John? Have you heard anything about that? St. John's? You mean out in the west side? I don't have that information. It just says St. John. No, don't know anything about that. If the person wants to email me, if they've got more information, they can. Okay. Um, and then the um, question Have you heard that Assumption Cemetery is much larger and some burials are under the road and bridge? Do you know anything about Assumption? I know it's an older cemetery. Well, it's about the same. I think it's close in age to this one. Um, I know that there has been a lot of work by cemetery management the last few years in terms of addressing some of the um, issues out there. I'm thinking with regards to um, water, that kind of thing. Um, but beyond that, I don't know any details. If there's a specific question somebody has about something, they can email me and ask me. I was if just, uh, hi, it's Linda. I was just going to say too that you've got to remember that Assumption Church originally was on, on closer to the river than even Riverside Drive. And that whole park in between Riverside Drive and Wyandotte, I, I'm sure they're probably are graves in that in that area i know my husband's ancestors that were buried there in the late 1700s uh, they were buried in the church cemetery whatever wherever that was at the time period so uh, and i have a feeling and i don't know this for a fact but nothing's ever been built in that square um, piece of land in between riverside and Wyandotte. Um, where where probably there there are burials there, so I think I think it's an old it's the oldest cemetery for sure, and uh, I don't know what what would be remaining of some of those um, headstones if there were any at that time. Do we have any other questions? Uh, one just popped up. Was Assumption Methodist? No, it's the Roman Catholic. That looks like it's it. Okay. Um, I just wanted to uh, then just end with this that um, thank you again for uh, Whether you enjoy the sun at the pool or on the beach, or you spend time in an air-conditioned library or museum or historical archive, we hope that you will take time to do genealogy. Bye for now. Hope to see many of you on June the 3rd at the library and that you will join us again in the fall via Zoom. So good night, everyone. <laughs>